Hello, everybody. This is Tiffany with the Speak Up and Inspire series. And we are back from a very long weekend. Hello, Miss Redia. How are you? Um, we are back from a long weekend, three day weekend, and we are ready to rock. There is a lot of good stuff that is going on right now um, in the world, with me, with various other people in the advocacy world. And so um, tonight, I don't have any special, special guests, meaning anyone dedicated for tonight, but I've invited a couple of people to come on when they get a chance. So we're gonna go ahead and get started right now. So um, let's see, we want to, what I'm gonna start out with is, this is um, the weekend that everybody is looking for, well, the last weekend was the weekend that everybody was looking forward to for the, everything opening. This is usually the weekend where the pools open, the beaches, the rates go up because everybody's running to the beach. But this year we have COVID-19. So it was a little different for a lot of people this year. And not just a lot of people, the whole world. The whole world is going through COVID-19 right now. So we're kind of in this together right now. So right here in North Carolina, we had a soft opening. And basically what it was, was a phase one, which actually started the week before Memorial um, weekend, where the governor opened up different stores. So there was beauty salons were able to open up, nail salons, nail salons opened up, and I haven't been there yet, but I'm going to tell you why later. Um, stores opened up, but they had to uh, adhere to strict guidelines. So they are asking them to continue with social distancing. So if you look at stores on the door, on the windows, or somewhere in the entryway, you are seeing these crazy lines where you can only go in one way and only come out another way. Then they have up a maximum occupancy number. And you probably are seeing people standing at the doors um, holding their little pads or they're holding something showing or letting other people know inside the store, people, I'm, I'm frazzled, okay? So <laughs> excuse me right now. I rushed in the house to start the podcast. Um, so when you see the go into the stores, you have this maximum occupancy. And I swear that Walmart is not adhering to that because every single time I go, I never see anyone counting. And there's a lot of people in there, like normal amount of people. So some restaurants opened as well, but some of them didn't because their owners, it was up to the owner's discretion or up to the franchise's discretion whether they wanted to open up or not. So this weekend was really, really crazy because a lot of places opened in North Carolina and across the US um, with soft openings or phase ones, phase twos. And so my thing is, is that what scares me the most about these soft openings and these phase ones and phase twos is the fact that people are going to get lax with the fact that now things are opening. So I know that I was able to get my son's haircut this weekend. Hello, Miss O. Oslin, the barber. She is the best female barber in Charlotte, hands down. I know some other female barbers. I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to go with my girl. Okay, so she cut my son's hair, and so it was by appointment only. Stores like nail salons, beauty salons, barbershops, so forth and so on are also doing by appointment only. Is that beneficial to us? Of course, but when we think about the overall of the county or the state that we live in or the world that we live in, that is just bringing more people out. So no longer are we safe at home because we have all of these people that are now out and about in the community. And I'm gonna be quite honest, my family was one. But what we are doing is we're continue to wash our hands every five seconds. We are wearing our masks everywhere that we go. And if we don't have masks, we're not going. We are limiting the places that we go because we really don't want to be out in the public with a whole bunch of people who really a lot of people are really not taking this seriously. And those that are, are staying home or they are 
adhering to the safety guidelines that my family is adhering to. Mask, wash your hands, social distancing, don't go anywhere unless you absolutely have to. But what is really, really sorrowful and what's really, really sad is hearing how certain parts of our country are still going through these massive um, COVID numbers that are still rising. And now we're starting to hear about mass graves. Um, New York and California are two of the states that have been reporting that their death tolls are so high that the mortuaries and the funeral homes and so forth can't keep up. And you do know that if a person is admitted to the hospital, then you can't have visitors. So a lot of people, unfortunately, are passing away or are sick in the hospital and not able to see their families, their spouses, their children, unless they're FaceTiming or Skyping. And if they're worse off or in ICU, they're not even able to do that. And then, unfortunately, if something happens, tragically happens to them, and they pass away, then they passed away with nobody there with them. And then it's taking weeks, if not more, for their family members to be able to take possession of their bodies to bury them. But then you have the 10 maximum number for social gatherings. There's no way you can do a funeral with under 10 people. But then it's so many people that have passed away or have died because of COVID or the coronavirus in New York and California that they're having these mass graves. So people that are getting sick, they're going to the hospital, they are passing away by themselves with only medical staff around them. And then they're not even getting appropriate burials or home going services. So even though there's been phase one and there's been phase two and the world is starting to open up, we still need to be even more careful because that means that there are people that are out here that are not wearing masks. I was just in Walmart picking up something real quickly and I swear out of 50 people that I saw, probably 10 of them had masks on. People are still standing side by side, passing each other kind of hard to avoid passing someone if you're in aisles because they have the arrows, but really no one's following them. And so people are really putting each other at risk by not adhering to the safety guidelines. And unfortunately, talking to a few of my friends, including um, my sister, or I call my sister, who is a nurse, they are already talking about that COVID or the coronavirus, it's going to taper off and go down. And then it's gonna rise back again in the fall or the winter. Just like the flu pandemic, someone told me yesterday, but my sister told me the same thing, that medical staff is already starting to plan for this to happen again. So even though there's soft openings and there's these phase ones, there's phase twos, phase three, please people, please, 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 please be careful especially with your young ones. At first they were saying that the children were not getting the coronavirus. Now children are getting the coronavirus. It's not just the elderly. It's not just people with respiration problems. Healthy people are getting the coronavirus and are dying from the coronavirus and including our children. So even though things are opening up, we still need to wear a mask. We still need to be washing our hands constantly we still need to practice safe distancing. We should not be having big, large gatherings. And we really, really need to put, a, put aside the fact that it's a pain in the butt to be at home all the time. I know for me, it was really, really stressful the first few weeks, being at home, working at home, having the children home, having them doing school, schooling at home, but it was necessary. And the twins understood, I understood it, even though it didn't feel good. So even though things are opening up, and I know, ladies, we want to run to the nail salon. I know I want to run to the nail salon. But please, be safe. Please, please wear a protective mask. Please wash your hands. 
and please be considerate of other people out in the community because there's a lot of people in the community who are not being very considerate right now. So I wanted to share some, I don't wanna say some knowledge because it's stuff that you already know, but this is from me to you, from friend to friend, who's asking you because I'm a mom and I have kids and a lot of you have kids, please, please, please adhere to safety guidelines. My mom told me today that her worst fear the last couple of weeks is getting sick and dying alone or me or my children getting sick and dying alone. No one wants to die alone because we didn't adhere to safety precautions. Please adhere to the safety precautions and please continue to protect yourself. This is not over. And I have a feeling that this is gonna peak again now that, now that the country is reopening. Please, please be careful. I do not wanna see on my timeline that one of you is sick or you've lost a loved one due to the coronavirus. And if you have, my prayers are with you. And I really, really hope that you are getting, um, are receiving some sense of comfort and that you are able to have closure and that you're able to mourn properly and that you're not going through what so many of the residents in New York and California are going through and I'm sure some other states are going through as well. So we're gonna start off with the low stuff and now we're gonna talk about some meaty things. So domestic violence is something that I am an advocate for as well as many of my other queens and empresses out there. But it's very, very important to have male advocates as well. So what we are doing, and you might have heard us in the past if you um, follow the podcast, that Cedric is going to be putting together, that Cedric is going to be putting together a male panel. We've already started putting it together. It is in the works. But I also wanted to tell you about a queen right now, Miss Affie Gaston. And she, right now, I believe at 7.30, was doing a panel on, let me see, I'm going to look at it. So it's Join Men Hurt to Support and Resource Calls. Now, this is the second one that she sent me. But Miss Affy is in the DMV area, and she has done two calls so far, or two podcasts so far, that aired tonight, and one last week at 7:45, talking about men can be hurt too. So what I wanted to talk to you about was the fact that this is actually a thing. Men can be hurt too, and we talked about it before on various different podcasts on, on, on various different um, platforms, but this is something that is getting attention now more than ever, as far as I can see in my personal network and in my um, advocacy network, that there's starting to be more attention to men being victims of domestic violence, but also being advocates as well. So I wanted to make sure that you guys look up Ms. Affy Gaston um, her, to pronounce her name, I'm sorry, to spell her name is Affy, A-F-I, Gaston, G-A-S-T-O-N, and she is the founder of, I don't want to say it wrong, I don't want to say it wrong, Miss Affy is the founder of Domestic Violence Wears Many Tags, so if you are on Facebook or Instagram, you can go to her page, it's Domestic Violence wears many tags organization. If you go to the organization, you will see it right here. So I'm gonna show it to you right there. Domestic violence wears many tags organization. And if you are interested in learning more about men and men being victims of domestic violence or men being hurt period, because men can be hurt in various different ways otherwise than just domestic violence. Um, I definitely encourage you to tune in to her podcast. It's, I believe on Monday, I'm sorry, on Tuesdays, and it's at 7.45 p.m. 
the one tonight that was on was talking about, um, it's a resource call, and this is a call for men to talk about mental health and as well as codependency. That was the, the podcast tonight. So I would highly, highly encourage you to look out for that. The podcast was on tonight, and it looks like it is Join Men, Hurt to Support and Resource Call. So again, if you are more interested and if you are a man right now who is a business owner, if you're a community leader, if you're just interested in doing more in your community and volunteering, I definitely recommend you joining the fight with us ladies against domestic violence. The reason why is because men, even though not, not most men and not all men are abusers, the majority of the time when we speak of domestic violence, the perpetrators are men, okay? That is a fact. It's a fact. You, you can't take that away. You, you can't put statistics over it and say that that's not true. It's factual. The majority of cases with domestic violence, men are the perpetrators, but you don't hear a lot about men being victims of domestic violence. And so those are two things that Butterfly Visions Project and Framley, which is Cedric's organization, is gonna be talking a lot more about this year and going forward is men being victims of domestic violence, men being victims of sexual assault, men being um, uh, advocates as well for domestic violence. So when I was looking up some information to talk to you about tonight, um, on this subject, I was on the, let's see. Okay, so I was here on the NCDAV website. So if you go to NC, NC, I'm sorry, ncdsv.org, if you go on there or you can Google men's roles in ending violence against women, I wanted to share with you something that was really interesting, okay? So the NCSDV feels that it is important for men to be involved with domestic violence or advocates of domestic violence for three key reasons. Those reasons are, while most men do not use violence against women, when such violence occurs, it is perpetrated largely by men, which is what I just said. Number two, ideas and behaviors linked to masculinity or manhood are highly influential in some men's use of violence against women. So basically what this is saying is that it's machoism. When men, when you think of domestic violence or you think of the reasoning behind domestic violence, it's all about control, okay? But when it comes to control, one of the, re one of the ways that men show their control is physically and that turns into being violent and unfortunately that violence in a relationship is against their partner and the majority is going to be women okay the third reason is men have a positive and vital role to play in helping to stop violence against women it says violence against women is a men's issue this violence harms the women and girls men love, gives all men a bad name, is perpetrated by men we know, and will only stop when the majority of men step up to help create a culture in which it is unthinkable. So right now I am working with um, C. Dwayne Hennett. He is an author and he has his book, The Ripple Effect. So if you were to go right now and Search for C. Dwayne <clears throat> Hennett, and his book is The Ripple Effect. You will see that several different websites come up, but I want you to go to. I want you to go to his Amazon page, or you can go to the Barnes and Noble page. I'm going to the Barnes and Noble page. And it says that this book, The Ripple Effect, is about the long-term 
and lasting effects of domestic violence. It's a detailed pathology of what domestic violence looks like, how it starts, and how it affects everyone in the victim's life, like children, family, and on a larger scale, the community. Most people only view domestic violence as an event between intimate partners, but it reaches farther than just one household. This book will chronicle the ripples of effects of domestic violence and how to identify possible victims. It also has what you can do to help someone who may be a victim. It's not just as it, it's not just a they problem, it's a we problem. So this book is really, really interesting. And the reason why I'm so interested in this book is because it is written by a man. A lot of domestic violence books are written by women because the majority of domestic violence cases are against women, right? So this is a book that's written by a man and it's very straightforward, it's very candid, it's very educational. And so we're putting together a men's panel made up of several very influential men. And I wanna tell you who those men are. Those men are, I'm going to get into it because I do not want to forget who everybody is. So let me see. Ooh. Okay, so those men that are going to be taking part or who have agreed to take a part in the male panel are, of course, the author, C. Dwayne Hennett. What we're going to be doing, all of the members on the panel are going to be reading this book. And along with this book and their own education, their own knowledge about domestic violence, we're going to be doing a series of podcasts to talk about domestic violence. The, some of the other members of the panel who have agreed to be on the panel are Mr. Brandon Chuck Brown, Mr. Cedric Sanders, Mr. James Sherman Thompson of um, Big Woo Entertainment, Brandon Chuck Brown, if you might know him as Mr. Excitement, he is always in the community, always doing great things, and he is always very supportive of Butterfly Visions Project and the Speak Up and Inspire series. So he's Cedric Sanders also, who um, this was his vision with Butterfly Visions to start this male panel this year. He is also going to be, he's going to be leading this along with myself and Dwayne. Jay Locke, who is the founder of Alpha Men Care. Jonathan Coleman, the founder of Blacktopia. Roger Green, he's an author and motivational and inspirational speaker, and then myself. So this is gonna be a very, very educational, very inspirational, and pretty, pretty um, heavy um, men on this panel. They're business owners, they're fathers, um, several of them are married, all of them have had successful relationships. And so they're gonna be sitting on this panel of men who are gonna be talking about domestic violence. This is something that we are planning to do within the next couple of months and hopefully we'll be doing throughout the year. If you are a male and you've ever been a, a victim of domestic violence, don't be ashamed to talk about domestic violence to your, to your family, to your friends, or even going to the police. It, you should never be ashamed if you are a victim of domestic violence, whether you're male or female. But a lot of reasons why men do not report that they have been a victim of domestic violence is because they're men. That macho, that masculinity, ego, and because of the fact that most likely your perpetrator was a woman. A lot of men don't report it because they feel that their masculinity is gonna be questioned, that they're not gonna believe, that they're gonna be clowns, and really just simply because they're men. <laughs> and you don't hear a lot about men being abused. But I do know that there are men that have been abused. I know some personally who have spoken up and who have shared their story. And a lot of their story of domestic violence had to do with mental and emotional domestic violence but several of them have also endured physical domestic violence. And so having this panel talking about domestic violence, talking about educating our men and our boys about domestic violence is really, really important. It's something that needs to take place. It's something that is going to take place and it's something that is already taking place. So if you are a man and you are interested in sharing your story of being a victim of domestic violence, then we would love to talk to you. 
you can reach out to me at the Speak Up and Inspire series page or our Facebook page, Butterfly Visions Project, and tell us that you want to talk about your story. If you do not have a story to tell, but maybe you witness your sister or your mother going through it, we would like to talk to you too, because we need men like you to speak up and talk about the violence that you've either endured or you've witnessed, because you play a really big part in domestic violence. Unfortunately, you make up the majority of, of perpetrators, but we also know as advocates that women can be perpetrators too. So we need you to speak up. We need you to raise your voices. We need you to inspire other men to, to share their stories, but we also need you to be advocates and to, and to put it out in the world that we need more men to join this fight about domestic violence and against domestic violence because it's something that affects everyone, not just women, not just children, but men and boys too. So I'm going to um, leave you with this thought that if you are considering doing something in your community or volunteer service, because right now being at during, excuse me, during the safe at home orders and during the pandemic, this is the right time to do something in your community to help somebody else. A lot of people are focused on COVID, but a lot of people are also focused on other issues such as domestic violence that also need to be addressed. And we need more men. We need more men in this fight to talk about domestic violence, to educate our men and our boys about domestic violence, to be advocates against domestic violence and just be there to be supportive of the fight that the Queens and I are in, but also that you can partner with us to reduce domestic violence, including homicides related to domestic violence. So many people are affected by domestic violence. And now during this pandemic, the domestic violence numbers have gone up dramatically. It's not a little rise. It is a huge rise in, in domestic violence right now across the country, not just in North Carolina, not just in South Carolina, not just in the Southern states, but everywhere. Domestic violence is on the rise. There have been newspaper articles about it. There has been, um, uh, mm, there have been mar magazine articles about it. There has been news coverage on it. It's a fact. Domestic violence rates have gone up during COVID-19, during this pandemic that we're in, and during Safe at Home. Because what is going on, what is going on is that people are home, they are stressed because they've either lost their jobs or they are working reduced hours. You might have one adult at home who is not working at all, or you might have two adults at home not working at all. That is stressful. I, I'm working, my husband is working, my kids are going to school, and it's stressful. I cannot imagine if something happened to my, my job or my husband's job. And when people are stressed, then your patience levels and your, 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 your mental health and everything is affected. And when those things are affected and you don't have the help and you don't have the support or you don't know where to turn to to get help, then that's when stress levels get high and situations get volatile. And unfortunately, it's increasing violence in home. So we definitely need more people to join this fight with us. This is not a fight that is gonna be solved this week, next week. It is not something that might ever be resolved. But what we can do as advocates in the community, as parents, as, as kings and queens in our communities is that we can do something about it. We can talk more about it. We can speak up more about it. We can inspire other people to talk about it and to speak up about it. We can share resources. We can advocate for those who are not able to advocate for themselves. And we can also ask you to join us men and women in this fight against domestic violence. It's important. COVID-19 is not only causing high stress levels, higher death tolls, 
but it's also causing high domestic violence numbers. And these numbers can only go down with your help. So right now I see that we have author um, Dwayne Hennett. He is joining us right now. And I'm not sure if he was listening to me, but you know, oh, up until now. <laughs> but I have him on right now because we talked to him last week during the Book Love campaign for Black Love Charlotte. But I also want to talk to him because he's amazing. And he's part of this panel. And we have agreed to do this panel together. And we have gotten a, a, a very good panel of men, community leaders, um, business owners, very strong men in the community to come on this panel to be advocates. And so I want to ask you, Dwayne, how are you doing today? First off, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Good, good. I'm not sure if you heard um, the beginning of the podcast and what I've been talking about so far, but what we've been talking about thus far is COVID-19 and the effects that it's having on our world right now, but also the effects that it's having on domestic violence and how domestic violence numbers are rising and are at an all-time high right now. And so I introduced your book and let them know what the ripple effect was about. But I wanted to bring you on because I think it's important that even, even though I'm a woman and even though I'm an advocate and I'm a survivor, that it's really important that the men that are watching or the men that will watch in the future hear from another man why it's important for men to be a part of the fight against domestic violence. So can you share that with us? Why are you an advocate against domestic violence? Well, I'm an advocate because I see the, the, the bigger picture, the bigger picture, the bigger picture, meaning that it's just not my generation, but it's also my kids generation, and also my grandkids generation um, that can be affected by it. So right. I see the whole big picture of it. And I see, like I said, the, the, the name of the book is called The Ripple Effect because there are so many layers to domestic violence. Mm -hmm. it's, people just see or assume that domestic violence means it's just the, the physical abuse. And it's not. Um, it could be emotional abuse. It could be mental abuse, um, financial abuse as well. Yes, that's true. Um, I, was, I mentioned earlier about men, when they are victims of domestic violence themselves, that a lot of times they are dealing more with the emotional and mental abuse from the women that they are involved with or in a relationship with. And that is where we're seeing the numbers when it comes to men and how they are victims of domestic violence, but also that men can be victims of physical domestic violence as well. So on the flip side, we have, we have women, they are going through the same forms. So domestic violence, it's not just a female thing. It's not a male thing. It's an us thing. It's a, it's a we thing. It's, it's a, a we thing. thing. Yes, it's a we thing. So it's really important. It's very, very important that it's not just me or women being advocates, but we need you. We need kings. We need our brothers. We need all races of men to, to, join in this because it's just really important that everybody get involved because we can't do it by ourselves. Um, tell us a little bit more about the ripple effect and why you decided to write your book. Well, I wrote it because I, I wrote my book because like I said, I saw how many, I saw how different ways that domestic violence did affect in the community. Mm -hmm. So like I said, I, I based it on, you know, um, a task force that I work for for the city of Durham they had a lot of different agencies, um, a lot of different uh, people that came together in the community support to help um, different cases that we had. And like I said, the, the ripple effect just wasn't, you know, about, you know, um, domestic violence, but how it affect the community as well. Mm -hmm. Right. So I know that you shared with us last week how you got into this. And can you just tell us really briefly how you got into this? Because you're not a survivor. So tell, how, tell us how did you really get into learning about domestic violence? Well, look, getting into domestic violence was part of the task force that I was I uh, was involved in. And that was through, you know, a job that I was with. Mm -hmm. um, I, when I told, when I, when you interviewed me before, I told you about a story about a friend that had, uh, that was, uh, um, she used to read over my speeches. And um, 
you know, edit my speeches and stuff like that. And I told you her, her side of the story of uh, what she went through. Now, as I go back and I think that really wasn't the first uh, involved. I've had, I had to go back and just re reevaluate and think about how many instances where I've, where I've seen domestic violence where I've been involved in it. One of the first ones, the very, one of the very first ones came um, when I was working at a hotel. Um, and I had this young lady who I, I usually go around and check, check rooms, see if everybody's out of the rooms, make sure there's nobody that's, just, that's not um, staying over or due to pay. Mm -hmm. So I went to this one room, knocked on the door, knocked on the door, and there was this lady that was there, this young woman. Um, she came to the door and I said, you know, will you be staying over? She said, no. She came mm -hmm. to the door. I could tell that someone had, she had been in an altercation because she could barely see out of her eyes. Mm. Like her eyes, literally, they were closed shut. Like literally, just like I'm looking right now, they were closed shut. Yeah. Um, and I said, you know, will you be staying over? Uh, she said, no, I'll, I'll be leaving. When I went, got back to the front desk and I was like, looks familiar. Mm -hmm. I was like, she looks really familiar. And I was like, where do I know this woman from? Right. And so I went back through and I was thinking, you know, where this, this woman that I knew, I couldn't picture where I knew her from because I, I the face, the name and the face didn't match. Right. I saw her name and I saw her face. And I was like, and I, the reason why I couldn't recognize her face is because she, she had, uh, had been in an altercation. She had a lot of bruises and she, like I said, both eyes were swollen. So I went back through, you know, my Facebook page. Found out that she was one of my Facebook friends. Mm -hmm. Um, found out she was one of my Facebook friends and I knew she had, like I said, I knew she had been in an altercation. I knew what I was about to do was going to be wrong and unethical as far as my position was. Cause I was a manager. Right. I, um, I called her and I, uh, I asked, I said, you know, if you need somewhere to stay, you know, you can always come back. We always have availability for you. Mm -hmm. Um, I knew I wasn't supposed to do that as a, as a manager and call her, but I, I felt that I had, I felt that I needed to, because like I said, I didn't know if she was in a safe place or not. And I knew that me leaving her, me telling that she was leaving, that it was going to put her out, possibly be in a not safe place. She yeah. could possibly go back to her abuser. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you went from having no experience whatsoever, whatsoever to getting a job on a task force for domestic violence to meeting someone on your Facebook, your, your Facebook friends list that was going through a domestic violence situation. So you really kind of got in there and just kind of took off and then were able to help someone in the midst of all this. Well, you, you, if you were, um, look back to, at your life and see instances Mm -hmm. and think about where it could have been domestic violence, where it could have uh, been a situation like that. That's what I did. I, I took inventory of, of my whole life. And like I said, I, in my book, in my book, I talk about how you can just point out red flags, how you can see red flags in it. I looked at red flags that were going on in, you know, other people's situation, other people's lives. And I just, you know, did inventory on that. And I was just like, man, I've seen a lot. I've seen yeah. a lot that, that, you know, on hindsight, now that you look at it, it's like, mm -hmm. This was a situation that that was, you know, domestic violence or domestic abuse. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know that that's the response of a lot of people that sometimes say, you know, I've never been a victim of domestic violence or I've never, like my parents, they were great parents, but I never witnessed anything. But then when they, they learn about domestic violence and find out that domestic violence is not just being hit, it's also mental and emotional and financial then they're, they're, they're just like you are able to say, you know what, maybe that was domestic violence and we just didn't know. Um, so I think that the, um, the myth that domestic violence is just physical is really starting to diminish because more and more people are learning about domestic violence now and they're learning that domestic violence is not just about having a black eye or a busted lip, it's really about being mistreated and being, <coughs> being controlled by someone. And that qualifies as being domestic violence. Is it, you know, go to your room and, you know, I don't want to talk to you. That might, might, might not be domestic violence. But when someone repeatedly puts you down or repeatedly withhold your needs or repeatedly 
pushes you around or, or just intimidates you, then that's when people, after they learn about domestic violence, they start to realize that, yeah, you know what? I have witnessed it. My, my friend, she went with that with her, with her husband or my Facebook friend. I know she had a black eye or something like that. So I'm really, really glad that the myths surrounding domestic violence are, are diminishing but I'm also happy to see that there are men like you who are getting involved. Um, tell us, what are you doing? You were on, are you still in the task force? I am not on the task force. Okay. Um, when I left and I came, I left for about six years from there. Mm -hmm. And then I came back. Um, okay. That was part of the previous mayor. Um, okay. That was part of his administration. Mm -hmm. um, when I came back, uh, that wasn't part of that department anymore. So. Gotcha. It wasn't um it wasn't a task force that I could be involved in, um, mm -hmm. but I worked with other departments, uh, other people that, for the city of Durham who worked with domestic violence. Great, great. So we've been talking probably the last two weeks, a week and a half, about the male panel that I came to you about doing because I felt that it was just really important, and with you having your book, The Ripple Effect, that it would be really, really important for us to get a group of men together to really just sit down and talk about domestic violence. Um, I see a couple of comments on the thread who are saying, you know, I can't wait for this male panel because this is not something that you see on, on a regular occasion is men talking about domestic violence. So what has been the response from men in your family or men, you know, that are friends or just in general from other men when they hear about your book and why you wrote your book? What is the response that you're getting from other men? Well, a lot of my, uh, a lot of my first sales came from, for my book came from men. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I approached, I approached it the, as this, uh, a lot of more fathers, mm -hmm. um, a lot of more fathers. If you have a son, if you have a daughter, Mm -hmm. Would you want them to either be a perpetrator or a victim? Good question. Very so good question. I approached them. I approached them that way, and I approached them as like, you know, do you have any female family members that's in your home? Mm -hmm. Any aunts? Any sisters? Right. Right. So a lot of my a lot of my first uh, book sales were were men that I that I, I spoke with. They found out that I was writing a book. They were curious what I was writing about. I explained it to them that way. It was, it's more than just the physical. Right. It's a whole lot. It's a whole lot more that goes into the, to the domestic violence than just you know hitting. Um, if you have a son that's young, like my generation, mm -hmm. like my generation, they have they have they have kids that's younger, they have kids that's you know teens, you know elementary school, middle school. This book would and to to get involved in um, finding out more about domestic violence and domestic abuse because there are a lot of things that people just don't realize what domestic violence is. Like you may see your son that has a girlfriend who's very uh, aggressive. When I right. say aggressive, meaning that she's always physical, not physical as far as hitting, but she yeah. always has his hand, her hand in his face. Mm -hmm. um, she's always, she, if you ever have a, a, a woman who cuts up your clothes or yeah. damage your property. <laughs> yes. That's abuse. True, true. And with, the, with this, with this, and I don't mean to sound like <laughs> I don't mean to sound like, but this this later generation that seems part of their culture, like seems part of their culture. Yeah. And I don't want to raise a son. I have I have two sons now. I don't want to. I I raise my son not to hit women. Um, so it's a it's a balancing act to say not to hit women, but don't become a victim also. Don't right. don't let yourself be abused by by someone else. Right. Yes, um, I have children too. So I have twins and I have a girl and a boy. So I'm educating them both about domestic violence and what domestic violence is and the different ways of domestic violence, but also how not to be the perpetrator because it's, you know, it's really easy to when you're angry to call someone a name. Or it's really easy when, you know, something happens in your relationship that you don't like and you want to, you know, throw their clothes out the door or something like that. Um, you know, and I'm gonna be very honest, when I was in my 20s, um, yeah, I would I I threw things and yelled and yeah, I've thrown clothes off the balcony and all of that kind of stuff. And never even thought about the fact that maybe at one point in my life I could have been called a perpetrator because when I got angry, I got angry. Um, 
So I think it's really important that in now that we know what domestic violence is, that we hold ourselves accountable, but that we also educate our family, our friends, our children, because just as much as easily as they can become victims, they can also become perpetrators, especially if they're ignorant to what domestic violence is. So not, I think just, that's not just the fact that uh, they're ignorant, but a lot of things that I, I wrote in my book talks about how domestic violence affects um, survivors after, yes, after they're out of their relationship, mm -hmm. or the next relationship after that. The next relationship after that, their walls are already up. They're already on 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 the fence. Um, they're already on the fence, so they feel like that next person or the next person after that could be could be an abuser. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, with high guards and high alerts and high high defenses, they're not even looking for you know the right guy or the the good guy. They're looking mm -hmm. for someone that's that they know that could be an abuser or that that is possibly their next abuser Very good. Um, that is so true that because is so they true. feel like the the last decision they made wasn't the right decision as far as a, a a mate right so they're always looking as far as that that this person may be an abuser if if he is an abuser i'm not going to be a victim right sometimes it turns out that way sometimes right. it turns out where they're so hot they're so high strung as far as being you know protecting themselves and protecting the heart, protecting everything else, that they may misinterpret, you know, signs. That's true. That's true. And that's one thing that when we go to the shelters that I like to stress to women is that go through your healing and, and learn to love yourself again. Heal <laughs> pain, learn what domestic violence is in its entirety, learn what the warning signs are, learn how to protect yourself, learn these things. Don't just leave the shelter and jump into another relationship because you're not ready. And you still use, you know, as advocates and as a survivor advocate, we have spidey sense. When we see things that don't look right, we usually are, are right. Are, we usually notice it before someone who's never been through it before. Um, but then you have some, you know, who are victims who don't go through the healing process, who have not healed enough to understand what help, a healthy relationship is. And so I really, really like how your book talks about what domestic violence is and what the effects are afterwards, because the effects afterwards can last you a lifetime if you don't address certain issues and address your mental health and heal from within first. So I really like how your book, you know, it starts off with defining it, you know, it talks about the effects, it talks about um, the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde mm -hmm. <laughs> theory that you have that is very spot on. So um, yes, I'm really, really excited that we um, have partnered up to do this panel. I think that it is um, definitely needed. I think it's something that we can really do a lot with, and I'm really excited about the men that have agreed to be on the panel. They're very great. They're great men, and they they have a following themselves. So I know we're going to make a really really big impact with um, with this male panel coming up. I really appreciate you being a part of it. Well, I'm I'm glad to be a part of it. I'm glad to you know even have people who think. Who have people who can think like me? When I when I talk about domestic violence, uh, it gets very uncomfortable. Yeah, uh, it gets very uncomfortable, especially when you talk about it with other men. It gets very uncomfortable only because then you start to reevaluate how you have treated your mate or yeah. how you're treating your mate then. Mm -hmm. um, and then some things, like I said, too. One thing that I, I, I talk about it is that uh, this book was really written in the pronouns of he and she. Mm -hmm. Only because ninety percent of you know ninety percent of, of, of victims are, are women, and right. too what I always used to when I used to do interviews, I used to say that it's, it's written like that because the the data that I couldn't get from men is because men don't talk. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yes, and I talked about that briefly earlier about how there are men that are victims who mm -hmm. don't speak up because they're men and because of 
the masculinity factor and you know how are people going to look at me if I tell them that, that my 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 wife or my girlfriend or my partner beat me up or you know cut my tires or what? threw me out the what? house um you know that's a big thing for men but the we worst need- option that, but see here's the word the worst option of that is that there are men that aren't here anymore because they were killed by their abuser which was yeah. the female partner in that relationship that's the other that's the other things that a lot of people don't see is that there are even though the data that I try to get or the research I try to do a lot of men don't talk about it but mm-hmm. the dead do talk mm. yes yes they do thank you for saying that the dead do talk um I have a a, a friend who I met her through her sharing her story and she was a survivor but her son was almost killed by his girlfriend um, because of domestic violence. Literally, he was on his deathbed um, because she tried to kill him. So it's it's very real. And women can be abusers too. They women can be, can be the perpetrators too. I, I put a post up about there was a, a NFL player. Mm-hmm. Um, his name was Eric Thomas for the uh-huh. Baltimore Ravens. Mm-hmm. And the story was that he left from quarantine with his wife and spent time at a, a B&B with two other women and his brother. Oh. Story is that she she got his gun from his house. She picked up a friend and they went to the B&B where the girl where the her husband was at. And she said they she says that she took out the the clip, but she left the bullet the, the bullet in the chamber. Bullet in the chamber, um, and she pointed the gun at him, put the gun at his head, and she threatened him. So, but I know as as being a gun owner and you know using a gun that I know that to get a to get a bullet in the chamber you actually have to cock it back and pull it. Yeah. So even though that she took the the uh, clip out, mm-hmm. that she meant business when she went there, and it could have ended a different way. Yeah, just the fact that she took a gun meant that she meant, I mean, I we when I went for my concealed carry, the instructor told us, if you take it out, you better plan to use it. So that's the first rule of owning a gun. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, thank you. Thank you for bringing up some of those points. And um, I think that this is going to be a very good journey that we're going to take together. I think that your book, The Ripple Effect, definitely needs to be read by um, men and other advocates, just the community in general, because it's a very straightforward book. Um, I really, really like, and I keep saying this, and you're probably getting tired of me saying it, but I really think, I really like the fact that it's written by a man, because so many publications, articles, news, so forth and so on is by women. We need to hear your voices, Kings. We need to hear what you have to say about this. And you come from, um, you come from, you know, growing up and not witnessing domestic violence to learning about it, being educated, and now you're sharing it. And that's the path that we want everyone to do is to learn about domestic violence, share it, and inspire others to do it too. So I'm really, really happy that we're doing this together. I applaud you for your efforts and everything that you were doing in the community. Um, we have another project we're doing, the, the Stomp project that was put on hold, but we're going to start gearing that back up again. So thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about it. I'm actually um, admitting Miss Radia. She is also a um, she's also an advocate, and she also was in the Book Love campaign for Black Love and. We're going to be talking about her book as well before we get off tonight. So thank you, Mr. Duane, for joining okay. us. And we'll be we'll be seeing a lot of each other, and so will everybody else. <laughs> thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. I'm glad that we are working together, um, hopefully to work uh, with many more projects about education as far as domestic violence. And we all need to be the change that we need to see. Yeah, we do. We do. Definitely. Thank you so much. Um, you can stay on if you want. It's up to you. <laughs> hey, well, we talking know. about her book? Yeah, we're going to talk about her book. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, Miss um, Rudia, I see that you're in there. Come on, ladies, so we can talk about this book. So, I've got the book here. I was happy to get it in the mail. 
There she is. Hey. <laughs> Let's see. She's coming on now. Hello. How are you doing, lady? I need you to turn on your volume. There she goes. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm doing good. Are you still on vacation? Good. No, I'm home now. I'm actually in a car. I just got home. So I was I pulled up. And it felt so good outside, but then it got dark. So I was like, oh, gosh, I'm going to have to turn the lights on. <laughs> it felt so good. And the mosquitoes started coming in. So, no, I'm, I'm not on vacation now, but I'm looking for another one. Nice, nice. Really? I actually just was looking, talking to my girlfriend. Um, she's a travel agent, and we're trying to get something together now for a girl's trip. So I'm going to let you know about that as soon as we get it together. <laughs> please do. Please do. Hey, do I will. I will. So... We got two authors on the line right now. We have Mr. <laughs> Dwayne. We were talking about his book, The Ripple Effect. And now we're talking yes. to Miss Radia, Star's Pen. <laughs> That's so yes. Yes. So oh I've got my package. You see, I haven't even opened it yet. I wanted to wait to, to, oh, be, well. to be live so we can open it up. So oh. we're going to open up my book. Oh, we got the YouTube unpackaging. Yeah. <laughs> yep, here we go. Open it up like a Christmas present. I know, right? You got some goodies in there. <laughs> got some goodies. Nice. Look at my book. Look at that, guys. Hi. Oh, that's a cute cover. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> An Erotic Adventure, An Erotic Adventure by Miss Stars Pen. So I'm going from talking about COVID-19 to talking about domestic violence, but now we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, pick it back up, pick it back up, okay? <laughs> I got you. <laughs> I have- all in, the circle. It's all in the circle. Yep, it full is. Full circle, full circle, because we're all advocates. So yeah. All right, we've got, an erotic adventure, Stars Pen, and this is the beautiful and sexy Miss Stars on the cover. Oh, God, hi. <laughs> All that makeup. <laughs> catfishing. <laughs> like, I'm catfishing on the cover. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to lose this weight so I can be on the, my next cover, girl. Girl, let me tell you, when they talk about working for the <laughs> shots, I worked for that shot. So shout out to Robert. I did yeah. the photographer. It was the middle of November. It was freezing. The hose <laughs> and the water is real. Oh, oh my God. That is, Are you serious? Yes. That photo oh, was actually wow. <laughs> in my backyard under my carport with my hose. And my hose is orange. <laughs> so he wow. did he did an amazing job on that cover. And I froze. So when, when we got one good <laughs> shot, I was like, okay, that's it. You know, that's yeah. it. <laughs> Everything was frozen. <laughs> yes. Well, I love it. I love it. So I am going to let you tell us about your book because I am going to be reading this with hubby. Okay. Um, you know, with us being full to be work full time outside the house, we have kids, so we're full time parents. We, you know, we we have to make plans and dates for intimacy and you know mm -hmm. adult stuff. So <laughs> right, 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 right. This book we right do. here. We gonna we gonna start right here. We are gonna start here. So tell us about your book. <laughs> well, it's it's a it's a plethora of different things. For me, I think it it was a lot of fun writing. You know, I like to I like to compare myself to Stephen King and Zane. So that's what I thought I was doing. I wanted to the, kind of give the world something fun, um, mm -hmm. something you could play with. But there's a lot of truth to it. So I wouldn't necessarily call it a bio, um, mm -hmm. but for those that know me and they read it, they're like, yeah, I remember that, you know, so that kind of stuff. <laughs> but there's a lot of life's lessons in there. You know, it's not necessarily, I try to, even though it's hard, I try to shy people away from just the sexual aspect of it because that was just supposed to be the fun part. Yeah. Um, if you read it, there is domestic violence. There's human trafficking. Um, there's some hard life stuff in there that some little kids had to go through um, growing up you know, to get to where they are now. So I like to, I, I'm excited to be able to show that in the film, um, you know, so it's, it's not so much about the sex, but what I found in a lot of my readers is that was a big help when it came to relationships. So that kind of excited me. I was like, okay, yay. You know, <laughs> I have to help some marriages and, you know, keep some people to stay together or whatever. And, you know, a lot of times we give up the best advice and 
we don't take it ourselves. And I think I'm perfect at that. Like I'm yeah. totally one of those people. <laughs> yeah. Well, I shared, um, but about a week and a half ago for the Black Love campaign, I shared that um, I read the first, I read the first chapter uh-huh. and whew. <laughs> I'm just going to put this up so you can see. Juicy's Revenge. <laughs> and when I tell you that Juicy's was Revenge was sweet, <laughs> Juicy's Revenge was sweet. So I am definitely going to start reading this with him. I was waiting to open it with you live so that uh, everybody could see it. And I will be talking about it. I will be talking about it. Yes. <laughs> I, I love I love to hear, you know, your ca- the favorite character or, you know, what you got out of it aside from, you know, if you say, okay, well, hubby learned this. So you ain't got to tell me all your business, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that Those details, I really love that because I really feed off of other people's opinions of the book, not so much for sales and that kind of stuff, but just to know that I'm not the only one that thinks like that. You know, I'm not the only right. one that I yeah. guess sexy. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I guess I'm not, but I, I, I know that I am the type of person that am not afraid to say what the rest of the world won't. And a lot of that is in that book. And I, that's yeah. where I think it helps a lot of people. Yes. Well, I thought that it was, it was great. Um, it definitely kept, caught my attention um, in the first chapter and I was like I cannot wait to read this with him the first chapter to him because um, I know he's going to love it um, but I also like the fact that it's it's not just about sex it's not mm-hmm. and even though sex is a big part of relationship that's not what the book is all about mm-hmm. um, it does cover a lot of issues and like I said this this podcast tonight is full circle from us talking about COVID-19 to protecting ourselves mm-hmm. To domestic violence, to men being advocates, to relationships. And all of these things are important nowadays in everybody's life. Um, So I'm really excited to read this. I know that you sent me two, one for my my friend Tasina, so she's going to be reading it as well. Um, And I'm just excited. I'm just excited to read The Ripple Effect by Duane and also reading The Erotic Adventure Wet. By Miss yeah. <laughs> I, I started some. I started some of Dwayne's book, and I totally can re- relate. So I'm, 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 I love it. I, and the, the, the man aspect, yes, I totally love it. See, you should have gotten in our anthology we just did, um, a resurrection of hills. You would have been great for that one. So okay. we still got some spots. You too, Tiffany. We still got some spots for some authors if y'all want to think about joining us on that one. It's, that's a dope book as well. Um, okay. I got Danielle Herset, um, the former North Miss North Carolina, mm-hmm. Dr. Andrea Blue, um, and Kendra D. Is okay. in book. So it's going to be nice. a really, 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 well, really yeah. honest. Tell us about it. I'm in whatever you're doing. I, I'm I'm in for it, girly. Yeah, I would <laughs> love to have you. I would love to have you guys. Thank I'll you. I'll, I'll get what you on the flip side and we'll talk about it. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. So everybody, thank you for being on with us tonight. Please go and get The Ripple Effect by Mr. Dwayne. Tell us how we can get, how people can get your book. Um, you can find my book on Amazon.com at The Ripple Effect, The Lasting Effect of, of Domestic Violence. Um, mm-hmm. You can find me on Facebook at C. Dwayne Hennett, and you can find me on Instagram at C. Dwayne Hennett. Um, you can go to my website and purchase it, um, C. Dwayne Hennett.com as well. Nice. Mr. Dia, how can we get your book? Oh, you can just Google me, Stars Pen, S-T-A-R-Z-P-E-N, um, or you can go to Amazon and get the book. But if you Google Stars Pen, everything mm-hmm. you need to pop right up. Nice. Thank you so much, guys, for joining me. And um, we will see you soon. Have a great night, everyone. Bye-bye. Good night, guys. Good night.